because we didn't have a topic either for tonight or for last week, or, or, um, I wanted to talk about this this uh, coding site that I've been become obsessed with over the last week. Advent of code. Advent of code. Um, it's just adventofcode.com, and um, this is the third year it's been going on. And what it is is that starting on it's like an advent calendar. There's a new programming problem every day from December first until Christmas, and you can see, you're, you're seeing kind of the app, like it's sort of along the way here, and it starts. If you just go here and have it, like if you haven't logged in or you haven't done anything, you won't see all this. Every day when you get some, you get your stars, it fills in a little bit more of the problem, and so the way it works is. So let's just go to the first day. Yeah. That term. Did I not say do not disturb? I don't know. Oh, nope, you did not. Um, well, you did not say do not disturb. So let's go on back. Um, so you get a problem. And then what they've been doing is that the each of the years so far has had a theme. The first, I don't know, it's something to do with Santa. They all have Christmas themes. Last year's theme for reasons you should go and read it, had, was all about the Easter Bunny. Like, if you want to know what the Easter Bunny had to do with Christmas, you should read through the problems from last year. Um, and this year, somehow you've been sucked into a computer because the printer that prints up the naughty or nice list has a bug in it, and you've been sucked into it to try to fix all these bugs in the computer so that the naughty or nice list can print. It almost doesn't matter. Because what you end up, so, so you get this thing, and what happens is there's a first there's a first part of the problem that you have to solve. And then if you solve that problem, you get one star. And then you get a follow-up question, which sometimes it, it varies from you have to add one line of code to get the second part, or you have to write a completely new program because what you've written for the first part is not going to hack it for the second part. Um, you don't have to. Um, you don't have to submit your code. All you have to do is submit your answer. So here, here my answer was 1393. Um, everyone gets their own grade, and then I had a second part, and then for that the problem, the answer was 1292. Every one of the problems has. Um, you get, every person who's doing it gets their own unique input to the problems, which is kind of impressive, right? So this was my input for for day one. It's just a bunch of, like, between, what, one and nine. And we'll talk about what all this means. Um, so, so because everyone has their own input, everyone has their own their own answer. So you can't just, so if you were to do it, your answer's not going to be 1393, it's going to be something else. So you could use my code, but you couldn't use my answers. Um, so you write your code with this as input. You're going to get sometimes a number, sometimes a string, and that's what you have to input. You don't have to show your code. Some people asked me that last week. You have to post your code. You don't have to post your, co excuse me, your code, but you do have to post your answer. Um, so I've been trying to solve these. In previous years, I did most of them in Perl. Um, this year, I'm trying to get better in Python, so I'm doing all of them first in Perl and then in Python. I've done all of them. This year in both languages, except for today, which I haven't done a Python because I got distracted by this stupid program this morning. Also, today's was kind of involved, and Python doesn't have closures, which is what I used to do to do today's problem. Um, so, uh, but I did think that it was good to go over some of these problems, and I can use that as kind of um, um, a mechanism or a gateway to talk about some coding techniques that you might not be familiar with that I find helpful in doing these sorts of things. So, um, so for problem one, what do we have? We got a we have a we get a list we get a list of numbers. So can we make this bigger? Is that a big one? It's pretty big. Is it big enough? Okay. Yep. Um, so here, these are some samples. So what you have to do is, for every number, if the number following it is the same, you add those up. 
So, and you wrap around. So, here one, the following number is one. So, we, add, we include that in our sum. One and two are different. Two and two are the same. So, we add that together. But then two and this one, when we wrap around, all right. So, here the answer is going to be one for this one, and two are three. Okay? Here with one, 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 this matches, this matches, this matches, and that match. And we get four. Nothing here matches. Here the only thing matches are these two nines at the end. So you understand what the problem is? What the problem is, right? Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is read in that long string and then run through everything and then add them up. And it doesn't seem that hard, except the only tricky thing is how to deal with this with this wrapping around business. So if you were was here last week, you know how I solved it, but um, <coughs> Anyone have some thoughts about how to handle the wrapping around part? So there's three ways that I can think of. Maybe there's probably more. Um, well, anyway, maybe you can think of Jeff. From negative one to n? You, and this loop? You could do that, right? You could have special logic to handle that last one. Like if it's the last one, then include the first one. And I think that's what, what Andy posted his, his code. He had done something like that. And that makes it pretty complicated, but that works. Well, right? Or just copy the first one on to the end and quit one early? Um, right, that was another way that I was thinking of doing it. Um, but I think a simpler way, I think, of doing it is with mod. So let me show you what, what my code looks like. So I'm going to show, last time I showed mostly my Python code. And So I'm just going to keep this here, so I won't give away one of the last one. So oh, the other thing, the problem with doing it that way is that that does part one okay, but it doesn't. It's it becomes a problem for part two. I should say what part two is maybe before I show the solution. Um, so once I got the solution to that, <coughs> part two is the same thing except you can only, instead of looking for the number that's right next to it, you have to look for the number that's halfway around in this like circular loop. So here the one and the one count and the two and the two count because they're halfway around. Um, here nothing counts because you're matching up the one and two and the one and two. Um, and what happens if it's an odd number? I think they're all even. I believe that they're all even, just the end of this. I think you're supposed to add them. I think you're supposed to add them and not just do that. So. Um, if only I had code that could do the rotate rot thing. Ah, but we do, and I'll show you what I did. So, so you should build a class that implemented a circular class. Right, but you kind of don't need to do that. So I'll, I'll show you what I did. So you understand the problem. So here you have to find the number that's halfway around from where it was. Um, See, so I got a little confused on the on the second part of this. Okay, for the second part, so for the first part, you look for pairs of numbers. Mm -hmm. so you have one number, the one after. Right. right. Um, for this one, if the length, you look at the length, and you take half the length. So if length is ten, you look for the number that's five past it. So, but you have to loop around. So right. we're matching up um, this and this, this and this, and then we wrap around this goes to that, and then that goes to that. Yeah, let's let's talk about how that confuses me. <laughs> it's it's complicated, and I don't know how to write that. So. That's that's why I wanted to do. That's why I wanted to do it. To show how to do that. You understand the concept? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I get, I get that. It is it's tricky, right? If you haven't seen it. Before. So, so some of this is just boilerplate. I read in the file name from the command line. Um, I just open it and I read through line by line. Um, I learned that I don't need to put, I need to always strip the new lines off at the end because you always have to do that. Pretty much always have to do that. Um, I learned that this is the default, so I didn't have to put the stuff in there. Um, and I'm going to sum them up. I'm going to initialize the sums to zero. Um, 
Um, now setting the step, the step is going to be the length of the line divided by two of y. Then I put int in front of there. I probably didn't need to put int there. I think I was going into crazy because it's been done. And in Perl, every time you have something that's numeric, you can treat it as a number. And it doesn't care. It just does the right thing. But if you have a string that's a number in Python, you always have to convert. It's all just a string. You have to convert it to an int with the int function. Um, so I have a loop over uh, for i from 0 up to the length of y. And then I'm comparing line sub i, which is like that position, with the one after it. But then I mod it with the length of the line. So mod just takes the, oh, we'll talk more about mod in a bit. But mod takes, you know mod is, is like division. If you, have, if you have two numbers, you divide it, you divide it. Mod is the remainder of that. And I'll talk about what that's useful for. But it's really useful for doing circular lists because um, it just handles all of that problem for you. If, if you have that, that list which is four, and you take four mod four, you get zero, and that points you at the beginning of the list. So that handles all of your wrapping for you. And all you have to do is just put that at the end. So this is just looking at, the, at i plus one mod the length, and then to get The one that's halfway around, I computed what that step. I should scroll it down a little bit. See, I computed how far halfway around is, and now if I add that amount and then mod it by the length of the line, that wraps me around to the beginning of that. Um, so, if you haven't seen that before, you might you're either bored or confused by this. Um, so, can you go back again? Yeah, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you another. Huh? Oh. Um, okay. Can you read that or is that too? That's good. It's huge. Too long? It's huge. Um, okay, so. So, just to show how mod works. So, if we have 4 mod 0, oh, I can't do that. Everything's going to be mod. So, same length as 4. Length is 4. four. So, 0. Mod 4 is 0. 1 mod <coughs> 4 is 1. Right, and then if I take 4 mod 4, that puts me back at 0 again. In fact, if we say 4 i in So this is like really useful. So this is a great way of getting something that cycles around. It goes 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah, okay. So mods give you a way to cycle back around to 0 again, kind of almost for free with just that one function. And it's, I probably have used mod in half of the problems, which is just useful for so many things. Another thing it's useful for is Let's say instead of modding it by 4, we mod it by 2. So if you mod something by 2, that basically tells you whether the number is odd or even. So if mod is 0, then it's even. If it's 1, that means it's divided by 2, the remainder is 1, it's odd. So that just gives you a way to see whether it's odd or even. That's super useful for problems, problems like this. I don't know if that has really come up. But, um, I end up using mod for everything. If you use mod today, it's not working. Um, it's also useful, it hasn't come up for this. If you have to, dealing with times, is another thing. So suppose you have like 104 seconds, right? And you want to know how many minutes and how many seconds it is. So if you divide it by 60, you get, we could be getting to one, right? So that's how many minutes are in there. But if you mod it by 60, you get 44. That's how many seconds. Right, so it's 1 minute and 44 seconds, or 104 seconds. 
halfway around a line. Um, so yeah, that's really all it's doing. If you, keep, if, you, if you go past the length, it wraps you back around, but, but not enough. So, um, okay. yes? Uh, if I say uh, int, uh, I uh, int, for example, in line 10, it's actually necessary. I don't think that line, the one on line 10 <coughs> is necessary. Definitely the one on line 13 and 15. Because there I'm looking at the value, but the length is already in. Oh, I know why I did that. I know why I did that because if I don't do that, then I get I get fractions at the end. Yeah, it is. I chops off the fractions. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, and if you use float in the array index, it gets some. Yes, right. That's why. That's you're right. That's why I did it. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on. Let's move on to day two. So anyway, this was, I mean, either super hard or super easy. Okay? Like, if you know that mod and you've parsed a few things, this is, like, it'll probably it took me a few minutes to do this. Uh, but if you don't know that mod in particular, it's kind of a tricky problem. The other thing you can do is just, you can append the two strings together. Like, just take the string and then add the string again to the end. And then you have to be careful about where you add into a triangle. Alright, so that was probably one. Usually they start with a few easy ones and then they start getting harder. But today's was a was a fair amount of work. Today's was not a beginner problem. Uh, but you also see every time it draws this, it looks different. Just kind of fun. Um, okay. So this was this was a fairly straightforward problem. So for this one, you've got a bunch of numbers, a bunch of rows of numbers. For every one of the rows, you have to find the largest value and the smallest value, subtract them, and then keep a running total of that for every one of the lines. And then your result was just the sum of all of those things, the, the difference between the largest and the smallest one. Um, so for this one, the largest one's 9 and the smallest one's 1, so that difference is 8. Here in 7 and 3, that's 4. And then this is 8 and 2 is 6. So you add 8 plus 4 plus 6, and you get 18. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, your input looks, this is what my input looks like. Right, so that's not actually, you almost could do this one by hand. Part 2 would have been a little bit trickier. Um, for part 2, what you had to do was um, for every one of the lines, there was a pair of numbers such that um, one of the numbers that, that the smaller a smaller one divided the larger one evenly. So you have to find the pair that were divided evenly, do that division, and then keep a sum a running total on that. So for the first one, 8 and 2 divided by each other, that's 4. On this one, it's 9 and 3, that's 3. Here it is 3 and 6, so that's 2. All right, so follow, follow that. So, so what do you have to do? I mean, you have to, you have to be able to read the numbers. You, have, you want to split them all apart, and then and do an array, and then move over here. Jeff looks puzzled. No, no, I, I'm, I'm trying to pre-calculate something. No. <laughs> so, I'm going to keep showing my program. zeros in here, or do they get eliminated because they'd be a problem? Is this, what day is this? This is L on day two. Oh, there's ones and there's zeros. Never mind. Are there ones and zeros? There are. Looks like there are. Where's there? Where's the zero? 
they're only two and they're all three and four digit numbers, aren't they? Now here, I'm sorry, here every one of these is one number, so you're looking for pairs of numbers. Every one of these columns is one number. Does that make sense? Oh. Right, every one of the columns is one number. So they're divided by three tabs. Okay, so wow. That last number, two nine on the top column, two nine six three, that is the number. That is a number. That is a number. Never mind, I thought I could only have to worry about the digits. No, you have to worry about the whole, the whole number. Oh, now there's real math at all. Damn it. Well, there's not so much math for the first part. Right? <laughs> so for the first part, I'll show you. OK, so uh, some of this is similar. I get the file name from the command line. I look over everything. I think I didn't. Bother is splitting because I think it splits on white space and I didn't care about the lines because I think it goes with white space. Um, so I have a list comprehension. This is like a map in Python, if you're familiar with maps in Perl. So basically, what this does is going to take the line, it is going to split it on white space, which are those tabs that are separating everything. Um, and then for, so that gives an array when you split it. And then for everything in the array, those, remember, those are still strings because it's Python. It doesn't know that even though they're numbers, it wants to treat them as strings. So you have to make them all ints. And then this packages them up into another array, which we call nouns. And that's a map. In Perl, it's a map. In um, other it's languages. It's a clever one line. It's a clever one line. And this is apparently what Python people do all the time. And then. I have two functions, one that deals with part one and one that deals with part two, and then I come out. So part one is pretty simple because there's min and max functions that work on arrays in Python. Mm -hmm. So I just return the max of them minus the min of them. Um, part two was a little trickier. I probably have more code because I was trying to be more efficient, but it doesn't matter. I mean, I just look over the two ranges. Um, no, I look over. I look over the range twice: once from zero to one before the end, which is what this is doing. The other one starts from one past i and goes all the way to the end. Um, I just look for the ones, like if the first one's greater than the second one, then I call x and y that. If otherwise, I you know I just sort out which is the largest one and which is the smallest one. That's just, which is what, what all this is doing. And then I use mod again. If, if x mod y is 0, that means they divide evenly because there's no remainder. And then I return int of x over y. Again, I'm just doing that int because otherwise I'm going to get 1, 0, 0, 0. And that's about all that you have to do for this. So I think the key things for this are that you can use split to split everything on white space, and I do that a whole lot for parsing. So it looks like it's hard to parse, but in reality, you just want to split, and that's what you have to do. So the Perl code looks pretty much the same for this. Did you contemplate sorting before you did part two? Um, I did and, not. And, and reversing the second, the inner loop to go from biggest to smallest? I did not. But that it, may it, have been. It, you know, the thing runs in, in like, two, like <laughs> two milliseconds or something, so I wasn't going to worry about that. Um, so I cut the max and min from list util. So that was that. Part two, I did write a function and then worked into the function. So I still call split, but this is how you split in Perl. Um, so I did chop it, and then I just split on on spaces, and it put it in there. Uh, so you don't have to you don't have to do that long this comprehension because they're just numbers, and you can treat them as numbers. Um, and this has lots of dollar signs in it, but it's exactly the same algorithm that it had in another one. In fact, I wrote this first and had it do that one second. Um, any questions about that? So the next one was the one that lots of people were trouble with. 
So just, uh, it'll just stop me. Six, seven, eight, nine, and it keeps spiraling around, you know, basically indefinitely. So you can see how this goes, and it just keeps going around and around and around. Right? They're going to give you a number. Uh, but all the numbers they go from one to however how you want to go. They're going to give you a number, and you have to return the Manhattan distance from that number to the one in the middle. Manhattan distance means you can only go left, right, up, and down. You can't go to that. It's like the streets are going to crazy. You can only go in three. So, for instance, if you were if you were at one, you could do it like to zero. Right? That's easy. If you're at eight, you're one away. If you're at nine, you're two away because you have to go here and here or here and here. Um, if you're at ten, then you have to go. It's three away. One, two, three, or one, two, three. Or so one. you can only go left. Left, right, up or down. Right? If oh, you're left, here, right, up or down. Okay. then you're one, two, three away still. Right. So it's so you can only go across or up and down. Right. Horizontal view vertical. Right. You can't go from here to here, except if I go that one. Right? Interesting. Okay. And what was my number? My input was yeah, this was my input. Two eight nine three two six. So I had a very big number. So how do you how do you solve this? So it turned out that I was working on these other set of problems over the summer called Project Euler, which are a whole bunch of math math problems, and two of them had this exact same spiral in it. Um, this is one of them, and the actual problem isn't that important. I think it will give a prime numbers or something like that, but. Um, People <coughs> told me doing this that you never had to generate the entire spiral and there were patterns in it you could use to your advantage. Um, so one pattern, and it's easier to see on this one because it's, it's bigger. Right? It's seven by seven instead of like five by five. Or one. one is that these numbers going down diagonally are, are all they're all um, they're odd squares. So they're all the odd squares. So it's three squared, five squared, uh, seven squared. The next one would be nine squared. Um, so and that is the largest number in that ring. So if you have that number, you can use that to know what ring you're in. So you don't have to generate the whole, the whole ring, the whole spiral. You really only have to generate the spiral that you have the, the ring of the spiral that you're in. Right? So if my number, so for instance, if my number is between 9 and 25, then I know that I'm in this ring here. Right? <coughs> and it also turns out, so if I were at the north, south, east, or west points. I know my distance to the middle is just what ring I'm in. So if I'm at, if I'm at uh, 23, I'm in the second ring, and my distance is 2. If I'm at 40, I'm in the third ring, and my distance is 3. So if I know how far I need to get to north, south, east, or west of my ring, I just add that to the, the ring number that I'm in, and then that's how you can solve it. So, and it turns out that these numbers also go up in a pattern. So this one is this one goes up by nine, by eleven, by thirteen, by fifteen, by seventeen, and it kind of goes around like that. So you can generate the north, south, east, and west axes, and you know the largest number on the corner. Some people have tried this and have various other ways that they've gone about doing it. 
So going back to day two really fast. I'm sorry to <laughs> I'm sorry to, to, to do that to you because I'm just looking sure, at it. Sure. When you do the columns, you're doing you're doing the first number on the column all the way down to the bottom number on that column, and then no, going I am there, doing, or? I'm doing I'm not dealing with columns at all, I'm dealing with rows. Rows are what you have to work on. Rows. Yes. So for every one of the rows, for part one, for every row you have to find the lowest and the highest number. And it's much easier to read rows than columns, because a row is just a line. Right, 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 right. right. So okay. So you would you start from you start from the, the upper left corner, you go to the upper right corner, and then do one row at a time. One row at a time, right? So what I do, uh -huh. I back. I'm sorry, I hate to make you go back. No, sure, sure. Uh, sure. Right. What I do is first I read in that whole line, uh -huh. and that's, you know, in Perl, you don't, you don't almost don't have to do it in Perl, but in Python, you call rebind or whatever you do. Right, 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 right. right. Uh, and that, re that gives you this entire line. Everything's in blue. Okay. So you have that. You have a bunch of numbers that are all that all have tabs in between. Them. Okay. And then when you take that and you say split, you, what it takes is it takes that that row of things that have tabs in between them, splits, breaks them up on the tabs, and then it makes an array out of them. So that this is the first element of the array. This is the second. This is the uh -huh. third. This is Okay, and so on. Okay. And then so on. Okay. So, and then I had to call int on every one of them to turn it into a number. But once I did that, then all I had to do was find the largest, to find the largest, now I have an array with a bunch of numbers in it. Uh -huh. And then if I say max on that, I get the largest value. So here it would be, uh, this one, 3494. Yeah. And I'd say min, and that would be the smallest 82. one, and that's EV2. Yeah. And then if I subtract those two values, I get whatever the so difference is. You don't have to worry about all the other numbers, you just have to worry about those two? Because you only need to know about the minimum and the maximum value. That was what the problem oh. was. For problem for, one. For problem one. For problem two, you have to look at all of them. But for problem one, you still have to, but you only have to do it to find them. Like, a lot of work is getting, so let me, let's bring up that code again. Okay. Um, so you're right in that it seems like it's a lot of work, but okay. all of that, so, okay, so, so this is like reading it in, and it's just, you know, it's just, this is just a language, just reading it. So once right. I've done that, once I've gotten to here, then line is the string. And this is just okay. Python, this is just Python syntax. Yeah, so yeah. Python works. yeah. Um, what I call this, and this is more, I could have done this in about four lines, but I put it in one line. Uh, okay. When I'm done with this line, now I have all of those numbers in an array. Okay? Okay. So, like I said, the first one is the first element, the second one is the second element, and so on. Um, and you could loop over all of them to find the minimum. So you go from the beginning and find all, look, look at every one and figure out which is the max, maximum, and then do it again to find all the minimum. But there's functions to do that, so you don't have to write that code. Yeah. So, and that's what we're this seeing. Is. Max vowels, min vowels. Yes. So max vowels is going to return the maximum number right. in that string, and min is going to return the minimum, the smallest number in that right. in that string. Right, right. And then if I subtract them, I get the answer. The okay. I think I can follow that. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's. I'm combining a bunch of different things into, into a few lines. I'm going to go on if you want me to stop or go back. No, go ahead.
Okay, so for this problem, we're pretending that we have passphrases. Because we're inside a computer, right? And we're looking at their, their like how they're dealing with, with passwords. Um, and here our passphrase are just a bunch of random strings separated by spaces. So here it's just AA and then DB and CC and DB and AB. Okay? So we treat those all, each of those random strings separated by spaces as a separate word. And then the passport is valid for part one so long as all of those words are unique. So here they're all unique, so it's valid. Um, here it's not valid because th there's two AAs. And here it's valid because even though this this uh, this aren't the same because this is one character long, it has to be exactly the same. Right? Right. So, again, I'll ask, so how do we go about doing something like this? So we already know about split, because we talked about split before. So we're going to talk about split. We're going to, we're going to, so we're going to read in all the lines. Oh, so this is what my input looks like. I, I had that up on the screen before I go back. Um, <coughs> so for those, for those, we can do it by hand, but not that long. But like this is what my input looks like. Yeah, there's like a couple hundred lines, of this, so you can't do this by hand. Um, so, so we can read it in and we can split it. But then, like, how how are we going to check whether we use the same word more than once? Anyone? That's Paul. Um, drop them in a set. Drop them in a set. Very good. Pearl doesn't have sets. Azunite. I, I was going to use them as the keys of hash. Right. So. Which is basically set ish. You can have that. Some like would just implement a set by as a hash, which has the same thing for the key and the value. Yeah. So this is how I did it in Python. I just I made a set, and for every one of the I split the line, and for every one of the. Um, Every one of the strings, if it was already in the set, then I return zero for false. I probably should have returned false because it's quite bad true or false. Otherwise, I add it to the set, and if I make it all the way down to the bottom without having found one that was already in the set, then it was a good passphrase and I returned it. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, the Perl code works the same way, except that um, Perl doesn't have sets, but I usually mock them up by just putting one in for the, for the value in the hash. And it works the same way. Um, OK, so that's part one. And part one is straightforward. Part two is a little trickier. Um, so now, for part two, <laughs> they, they, they not only can they not be the same, they can't be anagrams of each other. Huh. Um, Right, so this one's good, but this one's not good because this and this are anagrams of each other. Uh, and I don't know. Right, so you know what anagrams are. So how can we check for anagrams? Yeah. Jeff, anyone? I would take each of my words and make a new word out of them where they've been sorted into order. Very good. And they just compare the sorted versions. Yep, and that's what. Okay. You know where I learned this trick the first time? Um, because I don't, I don't know that I would have thought of this. Yeah. Um, I would have thought about this. Um, in the Kernighan and Pike Unix programming environment, I think that was one of their examples that they would look for anagrams in like user dict words. And that's what they did. So, uh, yeah, so this is. Pearl, um, yeah, um, so I, I split it, and then this, like, split on nothing breaks the word up into characters. I sort that, and then I join them back together, and then that's what my list of strings is. And otherwise, it's the same as Python. I think Python is a little less obfuscated. Maybe not. <laughs> now, it's more or less the same. 
happens to people. People say that that pipeline's clearer, but I'm not, I'm not sure that that's a whole lot better than the most important. Well, anyway. multiple digits, so with some number of digits on each line, positive or negative. We start at the top, and then on every, every statement, we, we jump that many, that many statements, that many, that many positions, either down or up, down if it's positive, up if it's negative, and then we take what was there and increment it by one. And then when we fall out either at the bottom or the top, we return how many steps we took to get out of it. So really straightforward, right? Um, and so the code isn't really all that interesting. What was interesting was how long it took. So, so to parse it in, I just for everyone the lines, I convert it into an int, and then I append it into this thing called program, which is just an array, and then I start my instruction pointer at zero, number of steps at zero, and while um, rather than while I'm inside the uh, the bounds of the array, I save off where I was, I add, you know, increase the Instruction pointer with that amount. I add one to that old uh, thing, and then I mean, it's, there's not much going on here. Um, Rachel, Rachel's Python code was 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 more clever because she didn't include the check here, but she ran inside a um, a try catch clause, and she checked for a, like array out of bounds errors. So she, she let Python take care of the bounds checking instead of instead of having to do it. Um, so for part two was was the same logic except that if the offset was three or more then you decrease the number by one instead of increasing the number by one which made the number of steps get really really big so you see my answer was whatever this is like 26 million steps right? and my input was you know which was all really really long this So I mean, like, so the code isn't that interesting, but I thought the timings for this were really interesting. So day five. So uh, time parallel is two. So I wrote this in Perl, and that took what, six and a half seconds. In a Python version, which runs in either Python 2 or Python 3. It's called Python 2, it's just Python. Python's a lot slower than Perl for a lot of these problems. 13 seconds, and it's the same exact algorithm. Python 3 is even slower. Ah. Did you do this one in C++? 
Yes, I did. I'm very interested in the thing. That is next. I tried doing it also in NumPy. I put all the numbers into a NumPy array, and it like tripled the amount of time. I don't understand why. I don't understand anything about yeah. benchmarking Python code. Um, okay, and I also wrote it in Python in C++. How long do we think the C++ version is going to take? No, you can't talk to you saw this last week. Not natural. Did you say natural? Natural. That's fine. Yeah. I, I believe this from a Smucker's grape jelly commercial. C C plus plus is really fast. And I mean I it's the same algorithm. I can show you what the code is. And Like I want to run fast. I don't think that's. I don't think it's cheating to run compile it with dash o three. Um, I didn't turn any of the other optimizations on. I didn't like do loop unrolling or anything like that. Um, and it like I think by definition can't do instruction prediction, right? It can't predict that far ahead because it's jumping around all over the place, right? So I I just don't know why the Python code is so slow. Why? Why? I have found the most bizarre things in Python. Like, I don't understand why using a NumPy array makes it slower. I don't. I've for a couple of the problems. What's the Python number? Well, not the Python. It should be okay with the Python with NumPy because this is a big full size number. Yeah, it's just it's just an array of. Yeah, the numbers. Think about it. How many array indexings are there in that loop? Every one of them has to be bound checked. Everyone probably has to be type checked. You know, you think about the number of checks, whereas in C, if you did read out of bounds, C will just happily just read out of bounds, you know, or Yeah, that's, that is true. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of checking going on. But it is probably doing as much checking because you can go to a race, if you go to a race of minus three, it's going from the end of the list instead of the beginning of the list. So that's a valid it's hard to go out of a yeah, but it's, yeah, but it's, it's, you know, it's trickier to get beyond the bounds of this. Yeah. Um, but you know, I was saying, like, that, actual I was thinking that, that by making it, you know, but you could argue that by, but it has to do that if it's a NumPy array too, right? But I would think that a NumPy array would be more compact, maybe it would cache better. Um, yeah, interpretive language I offense. I mean, I, I once wrote a little basic routine that was compiled. Um, this is like the DOS era. And all it did was just re retro IO port dumped into an array. That thing would take like multiple seconds to run this loop for, I forget how many samples it was or whatever. I ended up writing the thing in assembly language. You know, it's like a couple of instructions and man, the thing like ran it on the clock ticking. There was another problem that I did, and this was after I think so, either Rachel or someone else had pointed out. That, uh, for one of them, I had used a, num, uh, a Python iterator to do it. And by taking code which had been in line and putting it into an iterator, so now there's, an ob there's a class, right? There's an object, and I'm calling methods. That code was faster than having it be in line. And I don't understand that at all. When I took that code, and here I'm sure this was a different problem. But Snow. And I'm just screwing around with all these things. Thursday or Friday. 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 Yeah, Friday. Friday. Oh, it was Saturday. It was Saturday. Yeah. Um, Saturday the 9th. It was a snow. Yeah. I know because I arrived back from San Diego and found two inches of snow waiting for me. It was not a happy camera. Oh, 
wasn't that much snow. It was when it was 84 degrees the day before, and I hadn't even dug out my winter stuff yet. So, okay, this is... This is what the code looked like before. Like, it doesn't matter really what this is doing. But this was the code. Really, like, these couple of lines, it's like these three lines are in the length of the line. I took that code and I put it into an iterator. And it ran like 50% faster. I don't, I don't understand why. Scroll down, what's the thing doing? Right, and um, I just keep calling next. I call next here instead of having this code be in line. Then, okay, then how, I'm trying. How many array indexing operations are there <coughs> this way versus the other? Because that's kind of like what I'm covering. Because array indexing is, especially bound checking and everything, that is a, you know, it's a multiple operation. If you put it into a thingy, maybe you've done all those bound checking yeah, things. Yeah, but maybe I've done the bound steps. Maybe I've before, done like all that and all that work work better. That's yeah, versus if you have something that's sequentially processed the data, it's effectively. Well, every time I call next, there's 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 one array thing here, and I guess there were a couple more. Oh, there was like five or six in your other one. There were there were a bunch in the other one. Um, yeah, so maybe that's it. So every one of those you're going to calculate an offset, you go find multiply, and every single one of those is going to get bound checked, type checked. Right, and that explains why. When I took this line here, which was basically the same line, and I made a separate method for this so that I just call like value, I made another function called value and did this in it and I called it twice, that slowed it down again. Because now there was a, another method, another separate thing called it. I, yeah, I, mean, I don't know what it is. Because I mean, in theory, you can be done quickly, but it's just there's probably Python because of. You know, it's type on or type C, or C, I don't call that, but you know, the hand holding stuff probably adds overhead, and depending on, because in theory, they could check if you never assign, if they check the variable and you never assign to it, they could not have to check it again, but if they don't, then, or they do, then. So then I, then I thought, well, I, like, how could I do this in C++? Because C++ doesn't have iterators, and then I thought, mm. Oh, it does, because iterators are just like syntactic sugar. All you really need is to have a class with a next method. And that's what I did here. And uh, I think it was called the gen next value. Oh, no, here it is. And uh, that's what I did. And my C++ could still ran up like for a second. So. Uh, so Oh, and this is the, I can show you the code, and we were kind of running out of time. Uh, this was today's code, which was probably the ugliest. This is not the stuff that I'm most proud of, but this is an array of, of uh, closures, and it gets super ugly. Um, so, I don't know, it's pretty Try interesting. Cobalt. What? Try to cobalt. I have not seen <laughs> the cobalt. I've done them all in Perl and in Python, except for today's, and a few of them in C++ when I felt like it, and the, the parsing wasn't too hard. Um, and yeah, so I don't like. There's uh, there's a few things in Python. Like it's been interesting for me doing all of them in Python because I keep learning more in Python, and I have to say that. You know, if you put a gun to my head, I think there's like there's some good things in Python, and for some things I might say that I like them better than a girl if you put a gun to my head. Like you don't end up with with all of this like if you're iterating and all you have is like dollar i like i and j and k, you don't have to put the dollars in front of it. It makes the code a lot cleaner. Um, but the thing I hate the I hated the most about Python that's caused me the most issues is fact that we, every time you have, you can't just write a ring before loop in, in Python. You have to loop over a range. And the ranges all go to one less than the, the last value. 
And so, a lot of times that's what you want, but sometimes it's not what you want. And you always have to be conscious of it. Whereas in Perl, you can go to the end, you can go to one minus the end. You can do whatever you want. You're not forced to always be one minus the end, you know it doesn't make sense. Does range, to, does, is that zero based with range? But you can't do, so you can't do 110, so it's like 0, 2, and 1, So all of these are, all of this is really doing. Does, does range have a two-parameter version, like you range 1, 10? Yeah. So you could do it that way. And I think it's got, it's got a third parameter for, no, no, you can't. Because 1, 10 will go from 1 to 9. Really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's the way it works. It always goes to 1 less. Even, when you're iterating, you can also use that for array, array indexes for like slices, and it still goes one less there, and it's a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, <coughs> how do you make it out there, Pipe? Get number, <laughs> get number two working yet? Number huh? one. What's that? You get number one working. Yeah, well, that's fine. Yeah. So, so I, I think these are good. I mean, I think these are good. I think they're good problems they're for other great problems. problems. <laughs> they're great problems. They're great problems for people at a variety of levels of expertise. Um, you know, <laughs> um, because I think even you know, the first couple of them, the ones that I found to be pretty easy, are, are a pretty big challenge if you're just a, if you're a, um, you know if you're learning programming, and you know it's a good way to kind of get your feet wet if you want to, like, because there's all these problems that I, like, I don't have to think about it. Like, anyone that's done a lot of these kind of parsing, so, like, you know exactly what you have to do. But if you don't, then you really have to think about how, how you solve the different problems. Um, yeah, I'm having, I'm having some um, problems with day two. With what? Day two. Day two. Um, but, yeah, I need to bring your laptop to dinner. <laughs> yeah, I've been working on these kinds of things for like I've been programming Perl for over twenty years, and so a lot of this is like I don't even think about it. But, uh, but at some point, I did have to think about how you solve these different problems, right? And um, um, yeah, and for and and even if even for me, who've been doing this for a while, I mean, something like today's was a big challenge because you have to you're basically implementing a small little computer program, like you're you're. You're, you're emulating this stupid computer that you think you found that has a, that's about half of the commands, which is why I ended up doing this uh, basically. Uh, so, so, I don't know. I could go on, but I think I'm out of time. My voice is getting you old. are almost there. Yeah. Four minutes. So, if someone did that first, that day one, in like um, a Vim regular expression or something crazy like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, and it's good. It's also a good way, like, even for experienced programmers to learn a different language or, like, experiment with different techniques, like closures, which I hardly ever use except for these that kind of code problems. Um, so, you would go with them. Like you could do it with yeah. Rust would be a great or Scala or something like that to like try with different language. Um, uh, I got to um, oh for yesterday's yesterday's problem was fun too. Yesterday's problem was very easy to state. You 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 started with a list that just had zero in it and. For every one of the steps, you would you know, keep going through the list, some number of steps, and then insert another value into the list after where you were. Okay? And you had to do this, I think, 10 billion times or something like that. You had to do it a lot of times. It was 50 million. I don't know what it was. It was a large number. And you can do it for the part one was pretty simple to do it. Um, and it ran in just a few seconds. Part two was going to take 
like I, it was not going to finish. You know, Pearl was not in the obvious ways of doing it. Uh, in, in Pearl, you have to use something like splice, a splice function. If you want to, it's, it's very easy to add something to the beginning or the end of an array in Pearl or in Python, but it's very expensive to add it in the middle to the point where I don't think it was not going to finish. There's a linked list concept. Right, so they don't really have linked lists, so I thought this is a great time to figure out how to use linked lists in C++. They have a, li they have a list um, class in the same template library, but I couldn't even get that to work because it was tricky. You had to add it in, you had to, like, you had to add it after where you were, but in the, in the list function it always adds something before where you were. And I was thinking of using pointers. Um, and it turns out there's another class called forward list, which is a normal list and a doubly linked list, but this is a singly linked list. But it had an add after method that made it really simple. And even with that, even with that, it took, and even doing a C++, where there's only like this tiny little lock code, uh, it took, do I have that? I get it. By the way, guys, for the record, the Senate has is uh, considering doing a, an emergency vote to, or not an emergency vote, but a vote to restore net neutrality at least. Woo! Boo! <laughs> or they're considering it. So call your senators. Is this where who's the Senator Lewis? Yeah. So this was like the whole thing, right? This is the whole block. And it was good. It took about 15 minutes because you had to go up to some enormous number, like uh, 50 million. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right. So doing 50 million inserts, even in C++ linked list, it took about 15 minutes. Well, you're also doing something. You're searching every one of those inserts. You're also searching through the list for where to insert that sound. Right. You had to go, but you never. Because the insert itself. That is true. Every one of them, I think, you had to keep. Yeah. I forget. It's the searches that are probably slowing. Down. You didn't have to move that far for every one of them. You had to move like kind of a constant number of steps every time. But the inserts are pretty simple, and you, know, you keep going to the next one, the next one, the next one. You're not. You're, it is true that it's not like an array. It's more expensive than an array. Um, well, it, it turns out for this one, there's a trick for part two. Just remember to get to part the day 17. <coughs> Say it depends, but you, so arrays inserting into an array is very expensive. And inserting into a link list should be really, really cheap. That's really cheap. Right. But searching through it, but searching through it, so searching through either is a list is right, a little bit slower say, because it's not searching in, through a value. You had, to, you, had to, you had to go forward some number of steps every time. Yeah, you have to go about like 10 steps forward or something. Yeah, and a searching array is cheaper because you can just just like, advance the pointer. Right. You're you're just talking a couple assembly instructions. Right, um, this is more this is more model certainly. Yeah. The uh well, I mean only a couple assembly instructions are different. Because linked lists are pretty because you're random random access is pretty fast. Now, what is faster in an array if you know you want to jump to the five thousand item in the list and you don't care about what the values are? In a array, that's instant. You know what I you know what I think made it run was that either I don't think it was I think it was the memory allocation that slowed it down. Because you're you're allocating fifty million little blocks of memory. And alloc is awfully darn efficient, I think. But you're yeah, right. for little times, for little things, but if you do it that many times, then maybe it's trying to consolidate things or kind of those things. I don't know. It, it it could be it could be that. I didn't try to think. I thought this is taking a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. Is it a constant factor, St. Kilda? Yes, it's a, there's a big constant factor. There's not that many instructions, but there's a big constant factor. And it's 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 not like in in you know, the Perl way, like the Perl Python, where you're inserting it into an array, it's like n squared. But so it's O of n squared. This is really so big of of the n. But Any questions? Jeffrey's in his hand? No. Stretching. Stretching. We're getting ready now.
I'd have to think of the magnitude, because if you start doing a lot of searching, so 25 million isn't that many operations for modern CPU, but if it's if every one entails reading 100 items out of that list, well, then you got two more zeros, and you know, and if every one of those entails reading a thousand or a million items out of that list, now you know, now you're adding a lot of zeros, and now you're getting into the start getting into the trillions of operations. Oh yeah, for every one of them, that's right, yeah, for every one of them I had to go forward 314 steps. Maybe that's what it's like. What is it, like the thing loop or something? Yeah, that loops over. Is it always 314 steps? You don't, you don't care what's stored in those, you're only advancing that yeah. many? So that's where an array, that's well, it's certainly array would be painful, but array then... Yeah, yeah. In, an array, so you, in an array you add and you do a lot of... So the index and you just pull it right out. Um, but here you can't do that. You have to go. You have to go forward all all 314 times. So it makes you wonder: Is there a clever way to have a blank list that maintains not only a pointer to the next oh. one, but a pointer to the 314th element after it? Uh, you, and you can't. When you need really insert, can. really you would need to be, keep it. Yeah, no, no, that would be that wouldn't work. How would, <sighs> Because you're you're inserting things kind of randomly, and. Yeah, the problem is there was another there was another trick I'll let you write it in else else else. Else. There was another trick. Because what you had to do should I tell you what the trick was? Do you want to know what the trick was? No. No? no. Yes. I don't know. I don't what know. you had to do what you had to do at the end is you had to construct this big list with these crazy rules. And um, what you had to do so for the first part you had to do it and you had to say, what was the number, um, for the first part you had to only have, had to go up to 2017, and then you had to say what the number was after 2017. Okay? For the second part, you had to keep the same algorithm, but you had to, you had to do it 50 million times. And then you had to say what the number was after zero. But it turned out that because you start with zero, you're always inserting things after zero, that zero is always at the beginning. So you just had to keep track of, if you would have inserted a number at, like, does it, if, you, if you landed at zero and were going to put a number after it, you just keep track of it. But you don't actually have to construct the list, you only have to do all the mechanisms that you would do to construct the list. The other thing also, it sounds like your input was how many elements you have to skip. That seems fundamentally unfair from the standpoint of a, uh, if there's a competition aspect, because if your input is smaller, you have less so iterations. This, <laughs> this is the entire code for, for that. Um, so this is like looping over everything. Maybe I should do it in, I'll do it in. <laughs> I love your range. You got to do that, right? I hate, I hate range. Um, so, you read the stride in from the command line, turn into the end, and that was like 300 and something, right? That's where I want to go to. Um, I start with the length of one, that's how big my quote unquote array is. Um, I start with the result of zero, my pointer is at zero, and for everything here, I added the stride to that, and then I modified the current length. If p is zero, that means I've landed at the first one, that's going to insert one right after that. So I just keep track of what my result is. That's cheating, yeah. I add one to p, and I just keep doing it, right? And now it runs super fast. Oh, yeah. So. It's cheating, you know, it's not cheating when it ran 15 minutes before that I'm wondering, oh, uh, is it going to finish at all? And no, no, I spent no, a lot of time trying to get it. That's fair. It's the answer to the question. You wouldn't get the right answer if it were, you know. Yeah. So much have tricks. Okay, so. So pain is good for yourself. <laughs> no, no. Uh, we do go to the office afterwards.